Flow, we good for release? Copy, good for release. Good for release. All stations, Hercules is released. Hercules clear the transom. This is an audio slate for dive number 2019. UTC time is 2018.45. All stations, Atlanta is uh, free of Nautilus. Copy. Dive, dive, dive. I do not see any lights on at Atlanta. Camera's good. There's a little bit of light. There was uh, when we were closer to the surface. And
I just bumped the uh, iris. And that's as bright as it, I have now. So zoom works. Can you bump power to the camera? So if you move the camera, what happens? Yeah, it just seems like there's no light. Robert, if you slew Hercules around, I might be able to see him in the fisheye. Control, control deck, all stop at five zero meters, transferring control to van. Copy. Stand by, please. Bye. Backtack, we are proceeding to 100 meters. Uh, we are having some trouble with Atalanta's lights, um, so please stand by. The copy is proceeding to 100 meters, standing by on the back deck. I put it in auto. I put the iris in auto. This iris control has been wonky. Uh, I'm leaving it there for the whole dive. <laughs> okay. I had put it in auto uh, a minute ago and it didn't do anything, so uh, that doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy. Thank you. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob, can I get a power cycle for 30 seconds on Hercules? I don't have zoom control. Or on, you know what I mean. Back deck, back deck control. We have resolved our issue and proceeding normally. Copy that. Uh, continue with drive. Thank you. Bob, okay to hit dive salvo or dive special? Okay. Hello and welcome to those of you that are joining us. This is dive 2019. Hercules is headed back down to the western side of the McCall Seamount, our same dive site from yesterday. 
a little bit of a deviation from our plan today with the multi-beam mapping and surveying. We'll have to scratch that on this dive and focus on our photogrammetry. I'm excited. Yeah. Some technical issues that we've had this morning, but we are back on track. We may adjust the dive time of 11 hours or continue on. I'm not sure if, Jason, do you think we'll be making any modifications to the amount of time that we'll be down? I'm just going to kind of play it by ear. Uh, I don't I don't think we'll extend, but uh, we may, the last two waypoints or something might get shaved off. Yep. Um, different than yesterday. Yesterday we started uh, with the Norbit survey, and then we kind of flew through the saddle and then went up to the the top of this nearby peak and um, we hope to find a bunch of biology at the top of the peak there corals and sponges and um, hoping to get a, a really nice biodiverse setting for the camera and we didn't find it so today we've got this tabletop and we're hoping that the tabletop might uh, scratch the rugged complex terrain but then uh, also might yield um, a little bit more biology. This is part of exploring, you know, we just, mm -hmm. we're going off the best information we have, which is fairly limited from a biological perspective and uh, see what we find. Did a little bit of uh, collection yesterday on yesterday's dive and talking with Taylor and said that they had found a fossilized shark tooth. So she's trying to identify what type of shark that would have been, what species. It's exciting. And I always love going back through the chats from the last shift just to kind of see what they were talking about. Squid seems to be popping up every day on our ascent, letting their presence be known. Has everybody gotten settled in? Is everybody ready to do a yeah, there's brief a little round robin? We've got layer. some time. Oh, wow. Oh, there we go. We had this a couple of dive back. Yeah, right. Uh, Robert, could I please get power back on? A little twinkling that you see there. Bioluminescence as we're descending down into the water column. It's very dark. That twinkling, that type of light that's happening as we're descending through a layer of bioluminescence. Kristen. I don't know if that's. Are they going to. I think that's just reflection, right? Is that's that just not, reflection? That's not bio. Yeah, oh, no. Not, I miss. Are you sure? It's a I lot down at the bottom, seems to be. Wishful thinking. Will they capture well on, on camera? Kristen, what are you thinking? A little bit more of marine snow than anything else? Oh, can you set this for 25? Yeah, this looks more like marine snow to me now. Yeah. We might have had a little bit of bioluminescence at first, but...
Kristen, when we say marine snow, what exactly are we talking about? Yeah, marine snow well, is where are we going? a little bit of everything. It's it's organisms that live in this la in these layers. Um, so sometimes you have um, larvae of larger species or larger animals that float around here. You have stuff that's died at the surface and is kind of filtering down to the to the sediment layer. Um, it's it's a little bit of everything, really. <laughs> and this uh, is this a great place to do the eDNA sampling. Yeah, it could be. It definitely, it would be a, a good place to find a, a mixture of, of everything in the area. Yeah. Yeah, this will be a it'll be a little tabletop. Kristen, you want to start us off with your give us a little info about yourself? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I am Dr. Kristen Mitchell, and I am currently sitting in the data logger seat uh, aboard the Nautilus, um, and. Uh, I work for the Office of Naval Research. In. You're rocking this. <laughs> you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'm having fun. I didn't mean to interrupt your No your, problem. Uh, <laughs> but don't undersell your contribution. <laughs> uh, so I work for the Office of Naval Research, uh, and I work on the internship programs. Uh, we are nearing the end of our internship uh, application period. Um, for uh, paid high school undergraduate and graduate internships with the Navy. Um, and we have about 30 labs that uh, high school students can uh, apply to and about 50 labs that undergrad and graduate students can apply to. Um, the applications close on November 1st, so if you're interested, please have a look and, at, and apply uh, by October 1st at midnight. Uh, no, November 1st, not October 1st. November 1st at midnight. Um, and aboard the Nautilus, we've had a few interns, Nautilus interns, um, who are doing uh, ROV piloting and video. And we have science uh, science and engineering uh, interns abo aboard the Nautilus. So you can find out more information about that on nautiluslive.org. Did I hear you mention that internship that you guys are, are working with is actually paid? Yes, it is a paid yes. internship. Yes, and it's eight weeks for high school students and 10 weeks for undergraduate and graduate students. And that'll be taking place over the summer? Over the summer, of, yeah, 2024, yeah, 2024 next summer. summer. Yep, absolutely. An awesome opportunity. And you were telling us that there were a variety of different fields that someone could be interested in and, and participate yeah, that, in? that's absolutely right. We have uh, everything from ocean science to ocean engineering, um, medical, uh, uh, naval archaeology. We have just about anything that you can think of uh, that the Navy does. So anything that the Navy needs support for, we have internships available for those activities. Wonderful opportunities. Absolutely. Yes, for yeah, sure. Thank you. Have you enjoyed your week? We've been on the boat a week now. Yeah. We've literally been like out for a week now. Yeah. It's amazing. We're literally at our halfway point. Yeah, I'm I, having a great time. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you are too. I am. I am learning a lot. Yeah, same. A <laughs> lot. Yeah, there's so many great people on board. You Amazing can, people. Yeah. Lots of knowledge and experience, and every one of them have been so willing and helpful to uh, share their information and make sure the day moves along smoothly. Absolutely. It's been fabulous. Yeah, and it's been great doing the interactions with the science communication fellows as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Looking forward. We've got busy schedule coming up. Yeah, Monday looked really busy. Monday's pretty busy. <laughs> Monday's pretty busy. But that's a good problem to have. Yeah, absolutely. All that knowledge out there. Well, my name is Devin. I am your science communications fellow. I am 
by trade an educator, sixth grade science in Clarksville, Tennessee. And I am aboard the Nautilus for a two week internship. Super excited to be out here to learn all about STEM, how science, technology, engineering, mathematics all work hand in hand to make these missions successful. It's a joy to be able to collect this information and this experience, take it back to my students and share it with them so that I can encourage them and enlighten them on uh, the future and all of the different things that they are capable of and if they're interested in capable of uh, obtaining. Robert, is this a good time for you? Introduce yourself. You guys still work in some kinks out. Sorry. I'm Robert Waters. I'm the Hurt pilot, ROV lead this leg. Uh, I live in San Pedro, California, south end of LA. And I'm the OET facilities manager and ROV engineer when I'm not at sea. Thank you. Come on. Yeah, you do your do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> do your thing, Human. Um, I'm Human Moeen. Um, I'm a master's in mechanical engineering student at the University of Southern California. I live in Culver City, and on this expedition, I am a ROV engineering intern and pilot for Atalanta. How has this experience been for you? It's been uh, really great. Uh, I'm loving exploring through the ocean and seeing new things. This is my first time aboard a ship, so it's really exciting. Uh, yeah. Have you have you made? had any adjustments that you've had to make being aboard the ship? Are you used to being aboard the water like this? Um, I haven't gotten seasick, which has been pretty nice. Yes. Uh, I've, my sleep schedule is a little different with our, uh, our shifts. Um, but overall, it's been, it's been a pretty easy adjustment. I kind of enjoy the rock of the ship, to be honest. It is. It's soothing, isn't it? It's relaxing. Yeah. Yeah. Is it stressful in your position driving at Atlantis? Uh, I wouldn't say it's it's too stressful because things happen, you know, pretty slowly because we want to take our time with everything because we really don't want to risk anything getting damaged. Uh, but I would say the stakes are high because if you, if you mess up. Uh, you Robert, can... could I please get another power cycle? Power cycle, right. No, not much room for error for sure. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite part of watch is uh, Pete. You ready to talk? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, we did skip over now, so we did. Well, he was. He looked like he was busy. He was on his. It was, I just was worried that he was on his phone and working like multiple people texting and talking <laughs> and getting things together. I thought I'd just come back to the end. I, I didn't forget it, you. If okay. you're ready, yeah. if you're ready, I'll go after you. All right, sounds good. Hey everyone, my name is Johan Becker. I'm a PhD student at the University of Rhode Island in ocean engineering. I live in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, on this cruise, I am a navigator. Uh, it's actually my first time being navigator, so I'm definitely learning a lot and learning what it takes to perform this role. Um, but it's been pretty great so far. Awesome. I'm uh, Pete Thorderson. I'm uh, operating in the video position today. I'm also operating as video lead for this uh, leg of uh, NA-156. Um, I am responsible for all the record systems, the uh, top side cameras that you see when we do launch and recoveries, and uh, just making sure um, everything is recorded. We have all of the information uh, that is related to the dive, and uh, that's about it. I have a geotechnical background, um, so not oceanography or oceanography. I have a hard time with that word. Gotcha. Um, 
post uh, the uh, but but at the same time the technology is very interesting and there's parallels between geotechnical and ocean engineering so uh, one needs to be extremely waterproof and the other yeah. uh, may not need to be waterproof so there you go <laughs> and you were able to slide in pretty smoothly and pick up from land to sea exactly got those technical skills down pat yeah I'm still the dumbest guy in the room no not not even close not even close for sure. Well, our first row is all operations, holding down the fort, making sure everything is uh, running smoothly, and then literally doing the operating of the machinery. And our back row is led right, with power on, sir, please. scientists and camera operations as well. We have just two left to introduce you to, and as soon as they get to a point where they can do that, they'll jump right in. Oh, I'm, I'm good, Devin. You ready? Yeah, sorry. Okay. I'm, my head's in uh, our next dive anyways. I was yeah, always little, looking ahead. That's what that's what a good... I've got to kind of stay a day ahead of us. Um, yeah. Uh, my name's Jason Fay. I'm lucky enough to be the expedition leader for uh, this cruise. We're really, really thankful for the Office of Naval Resource for sponsoring this uh, cruise to, to test and push the limits of the wide field camera array. So we selected... Uh, some of the most complex terrain in and around Hawaii to test the camera and we've had just a great, great expedition so far. Uh, when I'm not doing this, I'm the Associate Director of the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. This is a, a NOAA-funded cooperative institute uh, that has four other partner institutions, uh, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the University of New Hampshire, uh, Ocean Exploration Trust with the Nautilus, and all the great people on board, and the University of Southern Mississippi, and those five partner institutions um, spend or are awarded about half of NOAA's ocean exploration budget every year to conduct research and uh, expeditions off of this ship and a few others. Do you travel to those locations, those other institutes, often to to work with them specifically? We. Uh, it's funny, we all rally on the ship. So oh, okay. <laughs> Nautilus has been, uh, every from a, a technology perspective, Nautilus has been the hub. So we meet virtually and talk about the how the progress in each laboratory is coming together and what we're going to do together on the ship. And then we get here together and kind of high five and check yeah. out and see how things are going. That's awesome. And so there is a bit of, like the team from Hui is up at UNH um, fairly routinely working on the Mesobot and Drix, these kind of vehicles from the last expedition interactions. But we don't all sit together at one place. You know, we're all at our parent institutions and then the ship is really the most collaborative part of our cooperative institute. I can see that that makes sense. And we have all kinds of people from all different backgrounds. Um, the diversity on the ship is pretty incredible, not just from experience and education, but um, just the opportunities and where everyone has come from. It's yeah, been yeah. really interesting to learn about everybody's backgrounds and, and how they ended up here. I think we're really lucky to have the, the partners that we do in the OECI because the if you imagine three technology teams coming out onto the ship together, having to share ship time, which is a precious resource, right? right. Um, it could be really, really hard to manage. There could be individual agendas that, that just don't mesh well together but with the group that we have uh, we have gotten into this groove where everyone everyone trusts that if they are asked to compromise on one of their objectives today that they'll be paid back with that right. extra time or that thing they need tomorrow and we have this like really really honest give and take yeah. and it has allowed us just to hit home runs the last couple of years we've been doing these technical demonstration projects um, and so I get the sense of that same vibe here, you know, from the the way that we've been using, like, even from everybody on board, right? We're, we're not diving 24 hours a day. We're so diving just, noise just 12 hours a day. And we're processing data in at uh, night. And this is kind of different for Nautilus, right? Nautilus typically is, we, we go to someplace nobody's been sure. before and we dive as long as, until we're exhausted. Right. Or we reach the top of the sea mount or whatever that kind of, and thing is, and that can be a couple of days in the water. And now we're we're integrating 
this new camera system and everybody's been just really really flexible with how we do that and accommodating for all the nuances and difference you, he, you hear jonathan asking for all these power cycles and it's like you know if, yeah. if this was a off-the-shelf piece of equipment you wouldn't think that it would ha need so much care and feeding but here this is a developmental one-of-a-kind kind of system and so we're every time something goes wrong or, or we have to work through something it's an opportunity for us to learn and everybody's so tolerant uh, of that learning process on board uh, it just makes me really proud to be a part of this team. Absolutely. I, I, I believe wholeheartedly here, here. that this has been a, a teaching vessel from every step of the every step of the way. Yeah, it's can. people willing to share and to help others understand and, and just everyone working together for the greater mission. It, it really has been enjoyable. Jonathan, I see you have a second. Do you want to introduce yourself really quick before you get busy yeah. again? Yeah. Uh, my name is Jonathan Peely. I'm uh, the Ocean Exploration Trust uh, media producer. And on this dive, um, this expedition, I've had the real honor of putting this camera system together. Um, the wide field camera array, AKA Triclops. Um, the system uh, was designed to do two things very well. Um, one is to record uh, to the very top tier specifications for projection in uh, venues like IMAX, Omnimax, giant dome, room projection for um, kind of a shared VR immersive experience. I can't wait for that to happen. Oh my gosh, I can't I'm wait. I'm going to be the first person. The Science the Center, just gonna, one or yeah. two and, and, and be able to share that across um, things like planetariums are hungry for different information yes. like this and will you get some professionals to do like the voiceover though or is it going to be like oh it's got to be jonathan is it going to be me talking about yeah. ice cream <laughs> <laughs> the most important thing of deep sea exploration is See? ice cream is even if that's what he said yeah it's welcome perfect. to inner space there you go the untoward land is this going to be your seventh job this is the new lewis voice clark yeah um so it, it's built to do that um, at the very at the very highest um, at the very highest quality, and uh, we take great pride at, at Nautilus of of producing to the very highest quality that we can, um, and this is truly a, a new frontier for us. Um, being able to put these kind of cinema grade cameras, cinema grade cameras that um, um, we have the option of deploying. Um, because um, you know they're 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 hours in terms of uh, the project management from start to finish. Um, we have a lot of guest equipment that can come on, but uh, it might be great. But yeah, once the guest leaves, um, we that you know the the cruise is focused on the capability across one cruise. This is the system that we've been building so that it can be an arsenal. You know, one another tool um, in Hercules's. Um, arsenal for for collecting a unique unique type of of experience so, so now yeah we've kind of launched this uh camera system with this particular cruise and this mission uh do you have a foreseeable timeline in the future where you can see this actually getting out to the public oh as far as the the um the data the, yeah and the it? imagery Oh my gosh, I'm going to move as fast as possible once yeah. we get back. You know, uh, Jason and I have a project um, uh, we affectionately call Rumi, the real-time underwater modeling Aww. initiative. And imaging, I think. And imaging, yeah. modeling and imaging. Um, uh, that we, we, were, we were really grateful. The, the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute funded that. Um, so we're going to be launching um, just the pilot program for a shared immersive video game and virtual reality experience. Wow. Um, that's kind of in the bag for us. And, and a lot of the uh, imagery that you see here um, is, is going to feed that experience. Um, we are at, at Nautilus, you know, again, we, we pride ourselves in showing reality. Um, and this uh, video game concept, this simulator concept, is is going to continue along that theme, where we're presenting real data, real models that you're able to explore, and then maybe we do wireframe some of this amazing Norbit data around it. Um, maybe we wireframe the entire ocean's bathymetry um, around it, and then you know stretch goals. 
stretch goals can be. Oh my be... gosh, there's, lim there's no limit. I know, there's yeah, just so totally. many options that you guys have to go through this. Wait, there's there's a great video game out there uh, um, that uh, it pipes in uh, real world uh, data off of a racing car. I think it's, a, it's an F1 simulator. Okay. So you plop into this video game and um, if there's a race going on, uh, you can sit in that virtual seat because they got sensors all over the track. You sit in that virtual seat or you can replay an actual F1 race and you can sit down in that and you can sit in the seat in the video game and see exactly where did they go? How did they approach the turn? What speeds oh, as a wow. simulator? But the most, the coolest part is that you can then race that person using the real data. The coolest part is that you can take at any point control of the car and choose your own adventure in the video game, right? Oh, wow. So that that's really stayed with me for um, an idea of, of, of this type of video game experience where we're able to map the true track of ROV Hercules across things like the Norbit data, present models of things that we saw along the route that um, you know, the, the, the concept of, of, of nonlinear learning for a kid, we can totally develop a lesson plan yes. where the your class um, or students or, or kids at heart can take control of ROV Hercules and go and go explore on your own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, procedural generation to create fantasy worlds to the left and the right of actual data, completely possible. Absolutely. Generating, um, um, uh, real lesson plans that 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 students can say like let's explore different flora and fauna um that's that's the kind of stuff I, i'm really excited to to go down um that path um as as we as we figure out how we're going to use these data yeah that's going to be offering our students um differentiation and being able to make sure that all students are able to connect through that content and understanding by using yeah. the different manipulations and tools that we have in order to make that yeah, yeah, reality yeah. be uh, real for them. Yeah. It's and, gonna and, be amazing. And we hope, and, and we'll, we'll continue to talk to all of the incredible science communication fellows, the teachers that, 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 are, that are in here to try to really align that with the realities of a classroom experience. We have, uh, where our science communication fellows come from different districts across the United States. and. It, there, there are real lessons that we can learn from our built-in um, network of, of alum as far as what's realistic. Some classrooms already have 30, you know, virtual reality headsets that were donated already or super jive and all that. They have 3D printers in the technology lab. That would be, um, it would be dangerous to assume that that's the shared experience of, of students oh, and, and teachers across the, the, the United States. So, and, and for that matter, globally. Right. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what makes working for uh, Nautilus exceptionally fun. That's what makes working within this framework of the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute exceptionally rewarding is because we're, we're already collaborating with other universities through this framework. The University of New Hampshire has an incredible technology visualization lab already. We're, University of Southern Mississippi, I'm sure, have their own uh, perspectives and feedback of how this could help um, illuminate ocean exploration uh, for their own college-level students. Mm -hmm. um, all of these elements, you know, HUI, of course, is, uh, is, is on the forefront of some of these uh, advanced concepts and modalities of, of operational control using 3D virtual reality, et cetera. Like, um, all those things together, plus the applied experience of how do students learn, how would this concept of learning complement what might already be in your curriculum as a, hey, if you want to have fun and learn this lesson at home, here's how you can do it. Yeah, resources are key for, yeah. for teachers. Yeah, and that, that would be just, uh, yeah. that would be something that makes this all worth it. Someone had posted that we need uh, David Attenborough to do the narration. I will be sure to things. email them yes, as, well. as far as possible, as fast as possible. <laughs> Welcome to the deep sea. He's done, he's done a lot. All the plan, I, I think oh, he's yeah, done all the yeah, planet yeah. ones. He keeps threatening to retire, but I don't believe uh, it. I don't think anybody's going to let him. Nah.
the deep sea. <laughs> so we're just still descending down the water column. We're currently at around 823 meters. Not a lot that goes on during the descent. It's pretty, pretty dark as we begin to get further and further down, just a minimal amount of light that comes through. So you get different shades of, of blue and the occasional occasional fish that might swim by. Nighttime seems to be the best time for the squid during the ascent. Got the glow of the lights that are on Hercules, illuminating the water that's um, allowing us to see the different shades of blue, dark blues that we see and the jellyfish that might swim by, the translucent. And we wait patiently. So we got some highlights from yesterday. We recovered a, a shark tooth, one of our scoops. We got some 3D modeling of the columnar basalts that we uh, dove earlier. Our intern Quinn was able to print out as well as 3D model of uh, Nautilus itself, complete with a little replica Hercules on the back. Absolutely adorable. And then we've been continuing to build the imagery, that virtual imagery from the multi-beam, which we are not able to use today. Had a little bit of an issue with that and we're going to tweak that and get that back up and running hopefully for our next our next mission open for some good highlights today as well Devin on our watch yesterday we were lucky enough to have join us uh, the folks from Maryland yes that they really uh, drove an interesting discussion about how we can bring ocean exploration to the visually impaired. Are you? Are they in the chat, or do you get it? If Have not heard if, from them. If y'all are morning. still uh, with us today, I'd love to, you know, continue that dialogue when we have time because there was just so much interesting to think about, and you, and we discussed how the the ability to model what we're seeing and then have that file readily available to someone to be able to print to yes. then tactilely like learn through touch um, could be an important element in those strategies. And so we we followed through on our end. We we built the model and we printed it on our printer here. And, and I think even everyone in the van that got to see what we were doing still got something out of being able to touch and feel Absolutely. The, the model. So there's just, I think that's a, there's, we can do better. And I'm actually excited to think more about that and reach out to the folks who are knowledgeable on how to how possibly to share what we do. Yes, and, and I, uh, uh, through that experience yesterday, having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with them uh, in our ship-to-shore interactions and then interacting with them on our live, I kind of shifted the uh, direction of my deliverable back to OET. Oh, nice. Congrats and on I that. And I'm definitely going to focus on that. And then I'm going to reach out to Maryland Public Library there for the blind and um, deliver that information to them so that they can then use that and share that as a resource to uh, the facilities that they would work with around their community. Uh, and then of course, we'll be able to have that live, uh, that document on Nautilus Live for any other yeah, educator yeah, yeah. to be able to use as well. Oh, congrats on- I'm excited about that. Yeah, locking in something for- Kristen, what's been a highlight for you on the trip so far? So yesterday we got to collect some samples um, 
and we got to process the samples in the lab with Dr. Ballard last night, so that was really fun. Um, and I'm hoping to request some of those samples to do a little bit of geochemical analysis to them from the, the, the samples that we took yesterday. So the samples being, um, I don't want to just call them rocks, but <laughs> that's what they look like. They look like rocks, yes, but so different various sizes. Yes, we got one that was probably about 15 pounds, which I will probably not sample. But we got a lot of uh, what look like uh, manganese nodules. Uh, so we'll investigate those further and see and see what they, they contain. So these were small yep. uh, stones. What's what's a good analogy for the size? Like a golf ball, smaller than a golf ball? Definitely smaller than a golf ball. Um, like a marble? Marble size? Yeah, a little bit bigger than a marble. Some they of were them like were elongated. They were. Yeah, they, they weren't, weren't round. Really, they were not very spherical. They were kind yeah. of. Uh, like those little rubber balls that you would get out of the 25 cent machine. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, some were that big, some were a little bit smaller than that. Um, I don't know, Devin. With inflation, they're probably like <laughs> 75. I don't they know. probably are at least a dollar fifty now. <laughs> Bitcoin now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You probably have to swipe with your Apple Card in order to get them. But I, I asked the size and kind of to describe more because I have the, these students in Maryland on my mind about you yep. know we're we see the image and we ooh and ah, but maybe we don't go through. Yeah articulate what we're seeing as well as we could to paint the picture for someone who yeah yeah so most of the samples were black um and they also had a bit of a smell to them so that was kind of funny to, to get Ooh, them in describe the lab. that i don't know i mean it smelled like the ocean really they weren't it wasn't a very strong smell but they definitely smelled a little bit like metallic-y and like about ocean ocean oh. and dr um, mary was was noting that the smaller ones were friable he could break yeah. them apart and yeah. they would crumble kind of in his hands yeah so they're very porous as well? I think they're more of like a mat. They kind of lay down, and so it's it's uh, sort of a, uh, they're depositing like slowly, so like they're not very thick. Okay. Um, so they're precipitating, precipitating out of the water, and and so they're it's a very slow process. And it's one of the slowest processes that happens so, sort of geologically and in the, in the ocean. Um, it's very slow, so it's a very, uh, you know, it takes a long time for the, those a pieces. A million years a millimeter yeah. is what was discussed <laughs> yesterday. Right. So that's a million years a millimeter. Yeah, wow. so each of those nodules that was the size of the uh, small bouncy ball, mm -hmm. what's that, maybe a centimeter and a half, so that's 15 millimeters, is that right? 15 million years, is that Yeah, that sounds about check right. My, yeah kind of wild living history we have a visitor from Sweden Robert you might be able to help us answer this how fast are Hercules and Atlanta uh, at Atlanta descending at the moment oh that we did this math yesterday didn't we yep. oh you got to hit your mic sorry we, we're going down about 25 meters a minute Currently, that's like a uh, warp speed for, yeah. for Herc. Well, <laughs> that's full <laughs> throttle. <laughs> Making up for lost time. Uh, going back, minutes. going back to the um, uh, accessibility conversation, it's yeah. a, of interest to me because when we were, uh, when I was at Microsoft, a uh, number of years ago, at the early beginnings of, of cloud cloud computing um, and AI. Um, it was a big focus of theirs, and I'm, and I'm assuming AWS, uh, Amazon, for descriptive audio captions that are automatic. And uh, one of the things that we were working with them was the marketing side of um, AI analyzing images frame by frame and putting together a descriptive audio track that was separate to, say, what we're talking about here. So it gives... Uh, the viewer an option to tune over to another audio channel and just listen to the descriptive audio side of what's going on. So that would be something interesting. That's awesome. From an AI perspective to uh, maybe take a copy of what we do and run it through the engine. Especially when we're on a dive site that has a lot of descriptors. It would be really interesting to be able to do as well. I don't want to put anybody out of a job, but um, 
from a mass processing perspective, especially when there's hours and hours and hours of footage and it needs a quick turnaround. Um, it may not be 100%. We did AI captions all the time. Right. And it was getting close to 98% accuracy, uh, which was pretty impressive. It's better than most captioners can, can do in a live caption environment. Yeah. And the key behind it is that it's beneficial. Anything for accessibility. Accessibility, yeah. yeah. Johan, have you had any favorite highlights uh, along your journey so far in this expedition? Yeah, I think my favorite part was really the calmer basalts earlier on in our trip. Yeah, Those that was great. were just such interesting features. Um, and I, I had never seen anything like that, or at that scale at least, and it was just pretty fantastic. We kicked it off. Those were the first dives of the expedition, too. So we went to just the, uh, just the show-stopping kind of uh, site. Uh, so if we had to, this would be a great time, and those are great things to describe. If we had to visually describe what we were seeing there, were these. So literal. okay, I like this challenge. So yeah. the columnar basalts—they're hexagonal in cross section, right? So if you cut it and look down at it but there are these tall columns of with that hexagonal cross section up to in some parts uh 80 feet tall and they were probably two feet thick mm -hmm. um and uniquely as it it makes this hexagonal shape but it looked like it was comprised of layers of what the team casually described it as pizza boxes that were kind of, if you imagine a pizza box being hexagonal and then they were stacked on top of each other for 80 feet, it, that's what it looked like as this, you had these distinct layers in each column. And the columns weren't individual, they were nestled together as if you had a, you were holding a bundle of straws, right? And right. they were all that shape so you could see. Oh, that's a great visual. In some portions you could see straws. all the hexagonal tops and then we would go down the, the cliff face and you could you were just looking at the wall of these columns, but they were all nestled like directly in contact with each other for as far as the camera could see. And it was just totally unique. And you know, we were one of the, f the few people who've been able to experience it. You know, that bundle of straws really is a great way to describe that. And they were a layer in this. So we were looking at it on a, what would be a cliff face. And it was a distinct layer of these uh, columnar formations with uh, more disorganized kind of rock and rubble basalts above and below. And so it was just this very unique volcanic cooling of that lava in this one section of that cliff that, that allowed these uh, the basalts to form in this very unique way. The remainder were kind of a mess, you know, mm -hmm. like a, or a standard, Jonathan almost I, I thought <laughs> I was going to have to catch him. He was trying to leave the van. I thought I was going to have to catch him. But yeah, that would definitely highlight. We should have saved it to the last dive instead of the first one. Now we're, <laughs> we start off with a bang and we had, uh, I think we set expectations really high for the rest. They've, the rest of the so dives have been else great. Has but been very valuable too. Yeah, that's true. So when I initially had saw those basalt gauntlets, I was thinking um, of how to describe that. And most people are familiar with the shape of a honeycomb. And so if you kind of took a honeycomb and made columns out of that and then just varied the heights, yep. that would be an easy way to try to familiarize someone with the way that that would look like is pretty, pretty amazing things that nature forms itself. Do we have an estimate of, uh, we're at 1172 meters now. Where are we, how far are we going down today? 1814. 1814. We're getting there. Another 20 minutes. 20 minutes, perfect.
They did end up finding some of those large coral beds uh, yesterday. They were spread out. I was watching downstairs and also upstairs. Um, you can see there were some pretty large corals from spaced out a little bit, but yeah, we were still there. a little deep. Um, so I was pleased with seeing them. Uh, I think folks have a sorry on board. We're hoping to uh, have these gardens, you know, and like yeah. Uh, I don't know if that would be a really really special find. Um, so yesterday was. I think I felt really good. All right, we have a camera and light question. What is the Hold power of Hercules lights? Hold it. Ooh. Oh no, I Wait was, for I thought it was, yeah, Oh okay. No, it's all good. The Herc stuff. No yeah, problem. the Herc stuff. Uh, the power of the Hercules lights in watts and the camera sensitivity rating. The ASA. I guess <laughs> we we can save the camera one for Jonathan when he comes back, but. Robert, what's special about the lights? Are they, uh, is there like a light bulb that you've got to change or is it? Yeah, all our lights are LEDs now. Yeah, I've, I've watched the progression of lights in my long period of it being out here. And we used to have, they started out with halogen lights back at the beginning and then they had metal halide lights and now we're fully LED lights. So. And it, what's, are they? They're more um, efficient. Yeah, are yeah, brighter and easier to, I don't know, what the, are the, some of the pros, I guess, of that Yeah, transition? the halogen lights put out a, like a more yellow light. It wasn't a flat. What's the wattage of those lights, do you know? They are about 240 watts per LED. And we have, I think there's 16 lights on Herc, I think. Well, yeah, I think 16 lights. Watching her come up at night once they, oh gosh, probably 50 meters what, 15 or something. meters yeah. as it starts yeah. to come up and you see the water start to illuminate and you get the different colors and the shading of the water from all of the lights that are around. It's just, it's beautiful to observe. Yeah, it is. In the ocean, especially at nighttime. It's quite, quite a sight. Lots of pictures. I think I probably have about around 7,000 at this point. <laughs> I don't know how I'm gonna ever go through them all. I'm gonna send them to you, Pete. Yeah, I don't have a light sensitivity or a, a sensor sensitivity setting or a stat for these Ikigami. So we have an Ikigami broadcast uh, HD camera in Zeus, um, but I can see if I can find it. It's an older camera, older technology. It's a uh, HD. Uh, we are uh, shooting it at uh, 1080p, but we are down converting to 1080i throughout the facility. And um, it is using a uh, broadcast uh, lens that's been modified to work inside uh, deep sea. And the company that makes uh, these specialized cameras is called Insight Pacific. Thank you, Pete. So interesting thing is uh, the metal halide lights that we used to have and they used on the Titanic dives way back um, would get so hot that you couldn't even start them up on deck. You had to put them in a bucket of water. They would they would get so hot that the plastic outside uh, holder would melt and the light would fall out of the housing. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, these, the LEDs, we can leave these on, and uh, they have protection. So if you leave them on for, say, 10 minutes or something, they might turn off for a minute and then come back on. But they'll never get overheated and destroy themselves. Huh. Bob, when did, um, uh, when did the industry transition from incandescent to LED? When? Yeah, how many years ago? Oh God, it's it's probably been over ten years, I'm sure. Yeah, I started in '96, and it was all they were transitioning away from the halogen bulbs to the metal halides. I'm guessing you guys went through a lot of halogens. Yeah, yeah, and it was very dim back then. 
they, they kind of relied on strobes to do the imagery, you know, with still still images. We had film cameras that, um, on, this is on Alvin, uh, we had film cameras and we had a dark room on the ship and we had to take test film in the morning on a pre-dive and then go run in and develop it real quick, see if the, it had sort of an overlay on it that was used LEDs, you know, little red character LEDs that would expose the film and put an overlay. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> Our chart plotter was uh, ammonia-soaked paper that used a, an arc to, to burn the paper. <laughs> And they actually had a slide rule for doing navigation. You just said you got slant ranges and you had to put them in the slide rule to figure out where you were. <laughs> okay, you're, thank you for joining us. I hope I was pronouncing your name correctly. We appreciate you sending in uh, your questions about the lighting and about Hercules. We love having you on board. Pete, you had mentioned those lights on the Titanic. Were you a part of that mission? That was before my time. Before That your was time? back in the 80s, yeah. Oh, okay. Was... Just thinking about all of the things that Dr. Ballard has had his hands involved in and all of the explorations that he's been a part of it's absolutely amazing and such an honor to be here and be a part of of this mission as well so thankful for his uh, contributions to science and willingness to share it with others yeah it was fun when uh, dr ballard joined in the van yesterday and i mean I, I still have my oreo Oh, yeah. I didn't need it. I'm going to keep it. But uh, <laughs> he sat down and was on uh, SPL uh, with the watch after us. And he, could, he is still just as excited about what we're doing as when he first started. It was just, in, yeah, it's easy to feed off that sort of energy. Oh, my goodness, yes. Uh, and also an amazing storyteller to be able to sit and listen to the stories that he can tell, you can just, I could do it for hours, just get lost in it. He's got so many. So we had a uh, Herc pilot out on the on our last cruise that was actually on that Titanic expedition. He was a mess attendant. Really? Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so was by working you know, seeing the operation was, did that something that inspired him to want to move up through the ranks and and get into the ROV or how did? I think so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know the exact story there, how he ended up going from mess attendant to, uh, well, I, he went, he was actually working at the machine shop at Hui. And then some of those guys that were in the machine shop ended up sort of transitioning over to the seagoing positions, so. Everybody starts somewhere. Yeah. And speaking of mess, it's getting close to lunchtime. It feels like all we do is eat. And I love it. Our chefs have been amazing on the ship. We have definitely been, I'm going to be so spoiled when I go home. It's going to be bad. I haven't seen people playing board games on this cruise. Like sometimes they, they get really active with the board games or I think last cruise they were making puzzles. There's, you gotta 
kind of limited range of things you can do to entertain yourself when you're not working. Yeah, last, there was a quite the backgammon group on uh, NA 155. Really? That would play uh, in the evenings on the social deck. Um, but it hasn't, uh, hasn't happened on this hit. No, I haven't seen still got some time. We still got some time. I think Robert's calling us no fun. I think I it's know. a <laughs> You guys are lame. Usually we're way more fun than this. Well, Robert, feel free to help me grade papers anytime oh. you want. You've got some spare time. I, I'm more than happy to share the workload. I didn't appreciate how busy the SCFs are. I didn't. Uh, I didn't know that your day jobs might follow you out here, and so that yeah. you're kind of doing both. Yeah, know? back home the classroom is still running, and in order to keep that uh, as c close to keeping up as possible, so that I don't go back to a to a madhouse, I it's very important that I stay on top of grading and logging, because I still have students at home that are uh, wondering about when that grade might get put in. And uh, I did a lot of work leading up to this expedition in order to make sure that my students received the content uh, and the timing that they needed to so that we can continue to learn at, uh, at the pace that, that our district sets. So there's a lot of um, work that goes into leading up to this expedition and maintaining. And then um, I'm quite positive that when I go home, I'll still have a lot to, to catch up on. But I was married to an elementary school teacher, so I, I know. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. She never had a weekend off. No, and it's, it's really difficult to be able to learn to put that boundary out for yourself when you realize that you have to, uh, you still have family, you still have yourself to put into the mix. and. Uh, what do you do in the summertime? Is there... That's Isn't usually recovery time. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, but actually during the summertime, we um, most people think, oh, you have your summers off. That's not that's not the case. We still have a lot of uh, uh, classes that we have to take. We have credit hours that um, oh, most, it depends. Continuing yeah, education. Yeah, yeah that's it depends upon your state and how many hours that you're required to do. But um, we try to spread that out throughout the summer so that we can have a little bit of break as well. But we stay busy. What's your, uh, you're from Tennessee, right? Uh, yeah, I grew up in, uh, I was born in Virginia, grew up in Florida, and then uh, by way of military made it to Tennessee. And um, so I've been teaching there now for 15 years. What's the uh, favorite thing about Tennessee that you enjoy or keeps you there? Uh, the thing that I love the most is uh, I get to go through all four seasons. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Different from Florida. Florida is not like that. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's either one extreme or the other. But uh, in Tennessee, and especially right now, my favorite is fall. Mm -hmm. I get uh, gorgeous colors of the trees yeah. as they are transitioning and the yellows and oranges and reds. Lateral. And yeah, then yeah. I, I lose power driving down. Slow it up a little bit. Robert, our viewers just want you to keep laughing. They think your voice is infectious. Huh. I agree. If anybody has dad jokes for Robert, so we can hear him laugh. Some dad jokes? Yeah. <laughs> dad jokes or bad jokes? <laughs> yeah, bad dad jokes. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> So someone wants to know, are we getting the full range of colors uh, that you used to with the LED lights? So these LEDs are quite flat in the in the band, but you know, uh, seawater absorbs uh, the red lights, so it tends towards the blue green. I think the lights are kind of biased towards red to try and even it out a bit. But, uh, yeah, I would have to look at the, the data sheet again and, and know that. But, uh, yeah, they're definitely way better than the old lights we used to have. It's a much more even color, especially in close. Very close to daylight. It's about as close as it gets to daylight with these LED lights. Awesome. Which is 6,500 Kelvin. Hard to put a light meter down at 
2,000 meters, but yeah. it's close. We have a 27-year veteran uh, preschool educator chiming in, reminding us everybody still works. And we've got, she's got 20 hours, or he has 20 hours uh, per year that they have to put in for their continuing, uh, continued training. And since one of the biggest misconceptions is uh, in education is everyone thinking we have all this time off. We don't. Yeah. And uh, on a daily basis, we put in a lot of hours. I often say my my work doesn't actually start until the kids get back on the bus in the afternoon and go home because I still have to um, wrap up that day as far as grading and um, being in touch with the kids and making sure that they all are where they need to be and then preparing for the next day as well as preparing for the next uh, week and what's coming up. You, Got to always uh, plan ahead and, and think ahead. So long hours. It's definitely not a nine to five for sure. Yeah, the hardest job I ever had was being the Alvin expedition leader. Because you have all the duties of the expedition leader, plus you drive the submarine. <laughs> mm. So you spend, you know, your two hours doing a pre-dive, 10 hours in the sub, and then you have a post-dive and then the meeting, and you have to do all the paperwork associated with being the expedition leader. That's that's a hard job. I've got it so easy. <laughs> I, no, compared to that, no kidding. But then the complement of people to help um, out here and, and the, the everyone wanting to contribute to like the plan for tomorrow, you know? Right. Um, it just it takes a load off of me having to be as prescriptive when we can collaborate and then everybody contributes kind of to the plan and can yeah. see the thing that they wanted to do happen and how it turned out. I think it all ends uh, up gelling together yeah, to make for the perfect day. Yeah. I really just have to send the email. <laughs> I Actually, I do a lot more. But the, you there's, you know, I got to coordinate <laughs> ice cream and yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> Is anybody on uh, this watch going into the next expedition? Anybody staying on board the next time? What is the, the next cruise is a mapping leg? Is a mapping right? and they have the uh, deep autonomous profiler from the University of Rhode Island on board. So they'll be, uh, they'll be having the lander over the side for a bit of it. Is Rennie staying on? He might be staying on. I think uh, he's leaving, I don't think he is. Uh, uh. Johan, he's staying on? No. Yeah, there's no ROV people staying on. Oh. Yeah, the this um, is my last leg for the year. going to take a couple of days and scout around Hawaii and enjoy a little bit of that before I have to head back. Looking forward to some adventures there. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. I've never done that. I've probably been, a, I don't know, a, a, over a dozen trips out to Honolulu and never seen more than Oahu. <laughs> <laughs> One time I drove around the island. Someday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to see it before Nautilus moves next season. 
For what? Nautilus is moving for a while next season, right? Yeah, so. yeah. Oh, that's right. American Samoa? Yeah. I've been there a few times, too. <laughs> so next year, yeah, we're getting more remote. So. Yeah, logistics and port support. And, uh, it's going to be very, very different than how nice we have it at the University of Hawaii Marine Facility. Yeah. You have to start eating more coconuts, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, from pineapples to coconuts, huh? Everything's just been top notch from working with OET and from day one, the application process to, to where I am right now. It's just been an, an amazing organization and just so thankful for this opportunity. So I encourage uh, any educator that's listening, if this is something that you think you might be interested in, go to nautilus.live, look at the education page, check it out. And, uh, don't think twice about putting your application in. Go for it. There is definitely, definitely something that you will walk away with from here that you'll be able to take back to your students in the classroom, to your colleagues as well. How are we doing? We on target there? Looking pretty good. All right. Atalanta will probably settle a little past it. I could bump the ship another. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's that critical. Yeah, uh, agreed. Yeah. It's kind of ambiguous waypoint. Yeah, coming up on it. Yeah, I see that we we're starting to get a Doppler beam. All right, so we're approaching our target. like rock because we're getting good uh, Argus altimeter. Yeah, we got three beams already at 95 meters, so it's rock. Sort of flat rock. You get it. You say you want to do white balance? Okay. Okay, we're looking pretty steady. I'll switch us over to dead reckoning. Okay. Yep. That better. What dead awesome. do you want me to stop at? Uh, why don't you stop at 25 meters altitude? Okay. Said as well. Look like her liked it. There we go. Okay. And uh, Herman, you can spin around and look at me. We'll come down in this configuration. Got it. Yeah, our first heading will be about one two five. So this yeah. looks pretty good to start. Satellite bay two gives you a good look at Hercules from Mount Atlantis. Yeah, we're going to 
I need to keep an eye on that virus on Atlanta. It's pretty dark right now. Are your lights all on? All the lights are on, yeah. Okay. Just just hold the delta there and it will be good. Okay. This doesn't look like rock. This looks like mud. It's surprising me. You got returns from pretty high up. We're starting to have a view come in of the bottom of the floor here. It's pretty, pretty sandy looking. Looks to be flat. Not very many rocks. So we did expect <coughs> to uh, land on this tabletop feature. We're hoping that uh, there is some large boulders and objects, you know, terrain to image around and stress the wide field camera array. So we'll be using the forward looking sonar on Herc to identify those targets. Um. Our what? earlier plan was to to use the Norbit and map okay. before, and we'd fly over this area at 30 meters and make this beautiful map, then use that map to, to break, navigate break from. Brake light's not coming on. But it, uh, the Ethernet bottle that's critical to the operations of the Norbit multi-beam um, had a problem on launch, so we uh. removed that bottle and no Norbit. Remote's enabled. Yeah, it's not showing the brake release. Huh. All right. Uh. Deck van.
And uh, video, I do have the production Mac up and running with the OBS viewer for Triclops. Oh, look at that. This is a rather sandy bottom, just a few rock formations mm -hmm. scattered throughout. We're just beginning to get to our destination to begin observation, so we'll hope to find a lot more in this area. So we made it to the bottom, but the uh, the winch. Yeah, so the winch uh, controls the cable that has the fiber optics and power conductor and strength members to, that allow Atalanta to get to the bottom. And it sounds like the uh, brake on the winch is being a little troublesome. We've been troubleshooting uh, the joystick here in the control van with that winch over the last couple of days. cameras all over the ship so when we're troubleshooting something like this we've got uh, deck chief TJ Scanlon in the winch room which is uh, below the main deck of the ship and we've got a couple of cameras in there that we normally use to watch the winch turn and just make sure everything looks good and uh, TJ's we can see TJ down there working on the equipment trying to transfer control from one place to the other Trying to figure out if it's the controller, potentially, or it's a malfunction with the brake on the winch. So is that why we were operating the other day from the back of the social deck? Yeah, the works? controller here at the Atalanta pilot station was uh, problematic. And so we switched. We had uh, half an hour, every half an hour, people would swap duties for controlling the winch. And we used a radio relay from the control van to that station to maintain operations it's definitely less than ideal but uh it works yeah yeah we were lucky enough to pull it off From the view that we can see now, we're starting to see a larger cluster of um, rock. Still that very flat, smooth surface. So we're sitting on the, what do you call it, the, sh the tabletop? Tabletop. Tabletop. Yeah. 
I don't know if that's a technical term, but. Good description. So we're about midway down the uh, McCall ski mount and uh, there was this flat tabletop like feature. So it's gonna be the start of our exploration. One thing for sure that I've been able to pick up is that we always have a backup plan for when things are not running smoothly. There's always a backup for, yeah. in this particular case, for the for the winch and the brake. Always good to have a backup plan. Always good to have a backup <laughs> plan. Well, the ship is the ship days are just so expensive, right? Um, Devin, do you have any guess what uh, ship t day of ship time costs? Um, I, I hate to say that I know the, I think I know the answer. Someone in conversation we had the other day, I heard this and yeah. I don't want to blow, I don't want to blow it for you. I want you to be able to. No. Kristen, do you have a guess? I think I heard the same thing De Devin did the other day. <laughs> oh boy. We've been asking lots of questions. <laughs> We've been asking lots of questions. We want to learn everything. Yeah. I think it's like $75,000 a day. Oh, that's higher than the number we heard the other yeah, day. Yeah. That's, that's true. Yeah. It is. Uh, so you've got to have this redundancy across most of the systems because to lose a day, to lose two days, you know, mm -hmm. th they add up very quickly. And yes. And we're fighting and scrapping for every research dollar we can get. And so uh, it, they are very precious. Robert, what'd you figure out with the winch? Uh, there's, there is something amiss. So, in order for this to be able to winch down like we were doing, right? Yeah. It has to have the brake release command. Like, but as soon as we stopped winching down and let it off, then we no longer had brake control. So, so it's not a wiring issue. This is, yeah. I'm now I'm kind of wondering it's about. It's that switch in the yeah, controller. Yeah, possibly the switch in the controller because it. It was fine until we went neutral and then tried to yeah. re-engage. So we're going to have to man or uh, Swing around get and some take folks to, yeah, to stand to watch. I don't that. know if I have a replacement for that switch, too. So we able to take a look at that eel? I think it was an eel to the left of that rock. Ooh. Oh, yeah, and on the Triclops computer, you can see that a model that we generated, our uh, dedicated data team. It's hey. not going out, though. Oh, whoops. That's nah, okay. We can put it on SAT-3. Oh, you might have left. Must have heard me say we were looking for Ooh. him. I don't see an eel. That looks like a shrimp, probably. He's still, we just got to back, you got to back up a little bit, Bob. We can see it on the uh -huh. wide field. Oh. Three, two. One. Oh, it's one of those. There uh, we go. The tripod fish, right? Tripod nope. fish. Nope. Even even further back, I think, from that one. Yeah, the tripod fish? Uh, I think it's under the. Under her. That's the that's yeah, the power of the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's camera. He's <laughs> there, there you go. go. There he is. Oh. 
ready for his live. Um, video, would it be possible to get the triclops on the upper right monitor? Oh. Kristen, are you able to ID that at all? I I can't see it very well, and I'm also a marine chemist, so <laughs> fish, well, fish juice. Like <laughs> I'm just asking everybody. It appears to be protein. <laughs> <laughs> Comprised, there's some lipids. <laughs> Ooh. A little shy. All right, so Robert, if we can get a, a kind of a scan around and looking at the the uh, sonar, just to see if we can if there is any targets to pursue or where the drop off is. I think Johan, is it is it to the behind Herc the the drop? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty All much right, so if we're on the edge, down. then we can kind of explore around this tabletop, kind of get a lay of the land, hoping that there is some large, hard feature that might be worthy of a photogrammetry survey. Um, I don't I don't see anything on the sonar. No, I don't either, <laughs> but. So Jason, are you saying kind of move towards waypoint two? And yeah, yeah, but, but I think the zigzag, the kind of see the whole thing, okay. um, we, we've got a time dedicated to be able to explore around here and we're going to we're going to take some time to do this photogrammetry survey so we just want to find a, a representative like ideal site if there is one sure thing it would be great to get a white balance we're going to try doing a white balance oh yeah all right roger white balance thank you all right well we have some shift transitions taking place our 8 to 12 shift is wrapping up and 12 to 4 moving in. Ali will be joining you. Thank you for sharing your morning with me or this your afternoon. What the heck's with this chair? So for about uh, 8 to 10 seconds, we're going to see uh, the camera go dark while it uh, does uh, auto light bounce. Stand by. Yeah. Johan, would you mind uh, zooming out, please, on the high-back survey? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. That's great.
Does Jonathan know he's on SPL singing? Was that Jonathan singing? Just providing, yes. just providing us a good soundtrack yes, for uh, during transition for, of the for transition of the watch. Good job, Jonathan. Beautiful, beautiful. What the, and I come in on the watch and find these beautiful 3D models of our Columbia basalts and Okeanos without its set dome. But yeah, there's also there's uh there's one in the in the studio also. Oh, here's the set dome. Oh. <laughs> That's the moose fish. Stop it. Oh, oh look. What? That's your it, moose fish. It's a goose fish or as monk if fish. Goose fish. Wait, is can you send that to me, please? As if goose fish is any better. Who is that in the chat? Is that in the no. WhatsApp? <sighs> Dinner calls. Very cool. Very, very nice. Okay, we're going through a change in watch right now, and so uh, there'll be a little bit of commotion uh, until we get settled down, and then we'll uh, start up again. All right, we all settled in, the watch all changed. Everybody here? Looks like it. All yeah, right. I think so. We know what we're doing. All right, let us know when you're ready, Dan. And we're going to just go forth with all due haste again until we see something interesting. Hey, Larry, uh, we're yes, headed please. to the top of this peak up here? Yep. All righty. Uh, yep. You ready to start moving, Dan? And our goal is to just see if we can uh, find one, some interesting two, targets five. for uh, Jonathan. And yeah. certainly that 
best odds of it where we have any photography. So. You're on a bit of a flat right now, but it should yeah. go start going yeah. up. Yeah, and then we'll get to a very steep wall eventually, but it'll take some time to get there. So it'll be interesting to see this contrast between what we've been looking at before. It, and it's interesting. You get a ch you get an idea of just how much sediment can accumulate here if you have a nice flat <laughs> flat area. <coughs> For those of you joining us, we are at a, uh, just a little over 1,800 meters in depth. And this is the 12 to 4 watch. Um, we're, let's go ahead and uh, do a little uh, bout of introductions. Manel, do you want to get us started? Yeah, give me like a couple minutes okay. just to get settled here, and then I got you. Okay, Chris, are you okay to, to get us started? Me? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I can do that. Hey, uh, yeah, I'm Chris Krasnowski. I'm here as a uh, navigator and uh, high-resolution uh, acoustic mapping specialist. Uh, when I'm not here, I'm doing uh, surface vessel, autonomous surface vessel research and mapping research at the University of South Florida. Thanks. Dan, are you in a position to introduce yourself really quick? SPL. Yeah, I'm Dan in the herd chair. <laughs> Bus driver. The, typ the typical Dan introduction. Yeah. <laughs> right. Dan is the pilot. That's all. That's his whole Extra identity. That's all there is to know. <laughs> <laughs> I am trying to look at uh, dozens of monitors with a lot of information on them and converse with at least four people in here. So yeah, that's all I can do right now. That's why he's got four eyes and six ears. Uh, hold on, let me figure out what's what's happening here. What's happening? Why are you going up? No, I'm going down. The other thing I have to do besides uh, <coughs> process a lot of information every several seconds is uh, figure out how to fly the RMV. Taylor Ann, you want to introduce there. yourself really quick? Sure. <clears throat> uh, hi, everyone. My name is Taylor Ann. I am the science manager and data logger on this watch, logging all observations, everything that we're doing. Uh, and when I'm not on the Nautilus, I am a research assistant at UCLA and a master's student at Cal State Northridge. Yeah, I'm uh, Larry Mayer. I'm the watch, watch leader on this watch. Uh, and uh, my day job is the director of the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. Rachel? Hello, everyone. Hello, world. I'm Rachel Simon, data engineer, currently sitting in the mm -hmm. Science One chair, helping run the cameras during survey, uh, representing the writing swells and typing in shells department. And I am Alejandro Martinez. I am a seventh grade science teacher from Eagle Pass, Texas, and I am the science, communica uh, science communication fellow on this watch. And it's my job to answer your questions as uh, you type them in online on nautiluslive.org. In case you're watching on YouTube, go to nautiluslive.org and you can send, a, send us a message or type in a question. We got Rye? What about Rye? Hello, everyone. Uh, right, right. speak Rye. up a little bit. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I think you're a little closer. Get the microphone a little closer to your mouse. Okay. Uh, Ready to start moving the ship down? Hi, everybody. I am yep. Good for a move. The Atalanta seat today, so I'll be the bridge bird's eye view of Hercules. Um, and when I'm not on Nautilus, I am working for Ocean Networks Canada. Okay, so we're, uh, one, two, five. we're exploring uh, McCall Seamount. This is a seamount we were at yesterday. And yesterday uh, we uh, saw some, what I found is pretty exciting stuff in terms of the, the very uh, different alteration, alternations of uh, basalt and, and carbonate deposits, or what we call an ice cream sandwich, and uh, some, some quite spectacular <laughs> structure. Um, we also were following up these ravines that seem to have uh, micro, micro nodules in them, and, and a very interesting uh, potential of we're actually seeing them flow down, flow down uh, down slope. Um, today we're going on 
the same side of McCall Seamount as we were on yesterday, <laughs> the western side. Um, and uh, we're starting off at a relatively flat plateau, which is kind of an unusual thing to have on a seamount. We noticed on the uh, earlier uh, multi-beam maps that there looked like there was some topography, some high standing stuff on there. And we're going to try to head there and see if there's some, some interesting features uh, for Jonathan's uh, photography, his uh, new camera systems, the wide field of view camera, the photogrammetry he wants to do. Um, and if we don't find much there, we're going to continue on and go up a, a rather steep wall. And the steep wall is uh, more typical um, of the seamounts we have around here. Um, and hopefully there we'll find some interesting stuff. Mm. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Faster. The uh, Science One chair agrees Faster. with Larry. Faster. Faster. We're doing point three. Are we? Yeah. We just have, I mean, it's, there's a current blowing you away. It just takes, I oh, think we gotta yeah, fight yeah. that. It's gonna take us a minute to get rolling. Well, here's a conundrum we always have. Uh, Atlanta's bucket of current, and we're yeah. you know tempted to move the boat faster. But then we have Thank a you, rather Richard. large layback. <laughs> yeah, and the next thing you know, we're <laughs> swinging into yeah. a wall. Yeah. <laughs> Again. <laughs> and I was getting Again. set up earlier, but um, my name is Manel Morangi. I'm the video engineering intern. Uh, so I am making sure that you all can uh, what what you all see looks good, and you know I'm. Uh, you know, doing the zooms when when requested, rare but but awesome when they happen. And when I'm not on board, um, I am working as a science communicator at uh, Maryland Sea Grant, and my specialties are filmmaking and photography. So I also get to geek out about uh, Jonathan's uh, photogrammetry here. Manel, can you tell us what we're seeing here on the quad? Yeah, so right now in um, so in uh, feed one, channel one, you're seeing uh, the uh, the camera on Hercules, which is affectionately called Zeus. In um, feed two, you are seeing uh, the view from Atalanta pointing down at Hercules. And in feed three, or channel three, you are seeing the Triclops view. So we've got the cinema cam, which is the majority of the screen and then um, in the bottom left and bottom right you can see the fisheye view which um, and Rachel you correct me if I'm wrong but has a 180 degree view um, and uh, so we're hoping to get some some pretty immersive video here today yeah, I, th I think it actually goes beyond I remember John Jonathan talking about 220 degrees uh, yeah Rachel. I think the the combined of all three is a 270 and again Rachel correct me if I'm wrong it would go 220 if you didn't have an ROV in the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, little trivialities little like that. Little details. Rachel, Rachel will comment on the uh, the actual field of view. Uh, yeah. So the um, so each individual fisheye lens is 180. Um, but the idea is that we want to make sure that we have some overlap between the two. So there's, you've got basically 180 on the port side, and ideally, like, you know, in on paper, 180 on the port side, 180 on the starboard side. And then you have, you do have a considerable degree of overlap, which helps um, relate the two images to each other. The issue is that if you, you know, if you didn't have any overlap at all, it would be difficult to align them in post. Mm -hmm. um, so you get 180 plus 180, and then minus the overlap works out to about 220. But um, a lot of the, especially we're about halfway through this expedition, so a lot of the initial part of the expedition was figuring out what's the best possible location on the ROV where we can install the cameras, get the widest field of, field of view, but also not be concerned about where the, the manipulator arms or the sampling Sorry, boxes or the tether there, might land. Now, I guess a question for Dan and Rachel. I think this morning I noticed an image that showed that the camera housings were slightly ahead of the porch. Is that so? Are we living in dangerous territory now with having a vulnerable uh, fisheye lens? Uh, nope. Um, protruding so the, in front of the uh, the vehicle. So I think the. Um, you know, the important thing to keep in mind is that at this point, this is probably our eighth or ninth or so dive of the expedition. So we've actually, uh, we have been using, we've kept the cameras in roughly the same spot for the last couple dives. Um, the, what was, we call it the tool tray, it can extend and retract. 
So the thing to keep in mind is that both the, the tool tray that the cameras are on and the porch itself are articulated hydraulically. So, you know, this, this position, you know, we've had a couple really successful dives and we've been able to do sampling. Uh, and in the event that the port and starboard, uh, the stereo pair cameras, if they do need to be retracted, then that's something we can do hydraulically. The uh, purpose of the photo there was, uh, so before we did poke the, uh, you can see there on the screen yep. in front of me, Larry, the, yeah, I see. The, so Jonathan has um, poked the starboard one out a little bit and uh, it was meant to have less occlusion from the porch there mm -hmm. and the port one would see the starboard one but he's got that one zoomed in a little so the the image on the left there on the top monitor two is uh, zoomed in the one on the right is zoomed out and so this is all part of this optimizing the settings to yeah he's he's uh, going for a little something mm -hmm. something different there i'm not right. sure what the details are but the purpose of uh, the photo was to so before if we had both hydraulic functions extended all the way the cameras were still in a safe position mm -hmm. Now it's possible for the operator to, uh, you know, extend the camera further than the port. So, so then just way we can blame it on the operator as opposed to the well, we usually do. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 always the uh, it's always the arrow, never the archer. And and Rachel, it, it, the overlap that you get between the two wide angle cameras is that use the parallax there used to do the photogrammetry or is yeah. it more a structure for motion type approach? So the, uh, so right now, and again, you know, something to keep in mind is that we have been doing some photogrammetry trials for each of the, I think we probably eight or nine dives we've done. Um, so right now the cameras that we're actually using for photogrammetry are gonna be the port side uh, stereo, which if you look on SAT3, that's your lower left. Lower left, yeah. And then the cinema camera, the actual center view, is it's the majority of the screen on uh, on sat three so the that pair of cameras is what we'll actually be using for the models uh there is a in the lower right hand of sat three you can see what we call the starboard camera and that one looks a little bit different it's uh it's